the Gospel of John, Session 3. Welcome back. Welcome back to our guided tour of the Gospel of John, the great book of John. Yahohanan, God's gift to us. Amazing. Remember, John referring to himself a few times as that disciple whom Jesus loved. He makes it personal as an example to you and me. The, the staggering realization that we need to make as Christians, as God's children, is that God in the dimensions that he has access to, is able to have a personal relationship with you and me. Jesus thought of you specifically, had you in mind, as he hung on that cross. And that's a, an amazing reality that is hard to grasp, but important, as we strive to have a personal relationship with our Creator, with our Father, and, and understanding that that's what he wants too. It's not just us. He desires he, he wants to have that relationship with us and that's a whole another amazing thing as well that the creator of the universe has a want an unfulfilled want and that want is to have a relationship with you and with me not just collectively his children but personally a personal relationship and of course we're going to read a, about that lamb of god that sacrifice jesus christ who made that relationship possible because God is perfect and just and holy and separate from us. And Christ is, Christ is really the answer, God's answer to man's religious problem. Our religions can't connect us with the eternity, with the infinite. But God, of course, can connect himself with us. And that's what he did. He became flesh and dwelt among us as we read last time. So we got a lot of ground to cover, so let's just jump into it. John, chapter one, I know what you're thinking, we're gonna be stuck in chapter one at this pace forever, but don't worry, we'll pick it up a little bit as we go, as we've laid some of the groundwork in the last few sessions. But we left it off in uh, chapter one, verse 18, where no man has seen God at any time, but of course, his son, Jesus Christ, his only begotten son, reveals God to us. Why? Because he is God in the flesh. Emmanuel, God with us. And that's amazing. You know, that brings to mind Hebrew. Oh, I think it's Hebrews. Don't quote me on it, but Hebrews, where God is, is the, the Holy Spirit reveals to us that as children of God, we have to come into this age and we have to go through this flesh age and be born of a woman, born of our mothers. And, you know, walk our way through here and write the test so to speak and god himself being that amazing leader he is amongst other things he wouldn't ask his children to do something that he wouldn't do himself and so he himself became flesh and tabernacled with us that is he dwelt with us in this tabernacle in this 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 weak rickety shack that we walk in this week he came and walked the walk and talked the talk, showed us not only led by example and showed us how we can strive for perfection. We can't reach perfection. If you even, we won't even argue that. We can't reach it, but we can strive towards that because he led the example. And then, of course, he, you know, I uh, correct myself. We can become perfect because of that price he paid. We can step into that role with him and when god looks at us he sees his son he sees that price he paid and our passport to heaven if you will is stamped free access and uh anyways john chapter 1 verse 18 we read and of course we covered that why did god do this why would god go through this this trouble to regain his relationship with his children. Well, it's out of love and it's grace for grace's sake. Grace meaning we don't deserve it. And he gave it to us anyways. That path, that reunion with him one day when all of his children will be reunited with him. Grace for grace's We don't deserve it. And if I can remember that quote that I butchered last time, grace is getting something that you don't deserve. Mercy is not getting something that you do deserve. And we know us in our fallen state, 
in our sinful nature, we know what we deserve. And God spared us that punishment, that separation from him, eternal separation from him, because there's no going back after that point. But he spared us that, his mercy and his grace gave us what we don't deserve, and that is an amazing inheritance in Jesus Christ. And I don't know about you, but my goal for the rest of my flesh walk on this planet is to try to discover what I can do, try to seize every opportunity that I can so I can really take, take, uh, be worthy of that inheritance. Again, I don't, I don't make myself worthy, but through Jesus Christ, through his Holy Spirit's guidance, we have salvation. And then from there, if we have no works to back up that faith, then our faith is dead. As we read throughout the word of God, we got to earn that, that status, that inheritance that we'll get in the next age, in the new life. Anyways, I'm pretty good at getting off topic. I mean, your job is to try to stop me when I get off topic. So let's, let's go. John chapter 1, verse 19. And this is the record of John. Now again, just to recap, we're not talking John, the author of this book. We're talking John the Baptist. Christ, Jesus Christ's older cousin by six months, who was sent prior to him by six months, sent ahead to pave the way, to prepare his followers, prepare his children, open their eyes, open their ears, get them ready for the Messiah, for Jesus Christ, who would follow him. Uh, let's keep going. So, John the Baptist, right, bearing record, when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who art thou? So, we see the the uh, the real muckety ducks, the real hot shots from downtown, sending in their troops to try to question John. You know, John is getting a He's causing a bit of a stir down there. He's baptizing. He's preaching. He's, he's doing his job. He's preparing the way for Jesus. And, you know, when you speak God's word, when you teach God's word, when you're planting seeds, when you're doing your job, well, that's going to upset some people. That's just the way it is. And, you know, I find it fascinating that the people it usually upsets the most is not necessarily the, the opposition to Christianity, but those crooked members among Christianity, if, if I can use that term loosely, because clearly they're not acting much like Christians, but it's the opposition from within this, this religious system. That's where the opposition is coming from. And eventually, you know, we're going to read in some of the other gospels that you know, that price that John the Baptist paid as well, being beheaded and, you know, paying for or, or giving his life for his message as well. Like like some in the future, and man, many are, even to this day around the world, you know, we live here in North America kind of a, uh, kind of disconnected by from some of the real pressure and the real uh, price that some Christians are paying around the world. So, I guess where I'm going with this is that if you take a little bit of heat because you are walking in God's will for your life, and that doesn't necessarily mean preaching. I mean, everybody's going to have their own, you know, it might be with a small Bible study group. It might be planting a seed. It might be just walking the walk and talking the talk as a Christian, as a child of God. But the point is when you are, when you're serving God, you're going to take a little bit of heat. And if you're not getting any heat in your life from that evil one, then, then you're really not pulling anybody. You're not getting close to the fire. You're not pulling anybody out of the fire. So you're going to take a little bit of heat. And when you do, we should be grateful. That's fantastic. I, I want to ruffle some feathers. I want to be politically incorrect. I don't want to say things that are popular because, well, you know, Jesus wasn't, he was popular, well, saying it in one way, but how popular was he? They put him on a cross. So clearly, he offended a few people as well. So as long as you're teaching God's word, don't worry about who you're offending. Don't please people. Please God. Let's keep going. So uh, verse 20, and he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. So these people, you know, and, and the community at large, they were expecting the Christ, the Messiah. So Christ in the Greek is the Christos, which means 
the anointed one. And this is the fulfillment. This is the equivalent of the Messiah, the anointed one in the Old Testament. The anointed one meaning that it's a, a separated one. He is, he is the one whom the Old Testament speaks of. Jesus himself would say, the volume of the book speaks of me. That means that every thing you read in the Old Testament and, of course, after Christ in the New Testament, it all speaks of Jesus Christ. That's why, remember, I said a few sessions ago, if you find a spot, you're having a little bit of trouble with it, you're not sure how it relates, how to understand, you put Jesus Christ right in the middle of it and see that scripture open up and recognize that prophecy is not just a, a prediction and a fulfillment, right? But prophecy is pattern. Prophecy is seeing events take place in that Old Testament and how they relate and are fulfilled and elaborated on by Jesus in these Gospels, as we're going to read. So, John, confessing, I'm not the Christ, I'm not the Messiah, I'm here, I'm sent prior to the Messiah. Let's keep going. Uh, verse 21, and they asked him, what then, art thou Elias? That would be Elijah in the Hebrew. And he said, I am not. Art thou that prophet? And he answered, no. So notice, recognize here, it's easy to kind of uh, read this verse quickly and assume that we're talking about Elijah, that prophet being, you know, referring to one person. But I find it interesting that even these, even the people at this time, they recognized the concept, the prophecy that Christ, Christ's coming, Jesus' is coming, his first advent maybe, but more specifically, the second time he comes, it's going to be preceded by these two witnesses, very possibly Elijah, very po possibly that prophet who we're not sure who they're referring to. This is a reference maybe to Deuteronomy 18, in which maybe they were expecting Moses to come again, just as we look forward to Revelation chapter 11. Prior to Christ's second coming, there will be two witnesses that will come and feed God's children, God's elect, spiritually speaking, feeding, feeding them that Holy Spirit, guiding them, teaching them, and preparing the way again, just as John did here in the spirit of Elijah, preparing the way for our king's second coming. This time he's coming when he comes next time. He's not coming as a baby. He's not coming to die on a cross. He's coming to rule and to set up his kingdom this time, the millennial kingdom, the Sabbath, the Lord's day, there is no other event that is spoken of more in God's word than that time in history. And what an exciting time that's going to be. And we say it, you know, in the Lord's prayer all the time, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. We, we're anticipating, we're ready for that kingdom. But, you know, I should add, of course, the disclaimer, the warning that Satan the Antichrist, that old serpent, he's coming first to set up his kingdom, that kingdom we read about in Revelation chapter 13, that one world government, one world religion, where he's going to very possibly claim to be Christ as the Antichrist. Anti, remember, it doesn't mean necessarily opposed to Christ, as we think of it in our English, with our English ears, although of course he is opposed to the Christ, but rather it means more instead of Christ, or in place of Christ. That means he's coming when, unfortunately, most Christians are expecting Jesus Christ. He'll come very possibly claiming to be Jesus Christ himself. So be warned, be ready. Let's keep digging in his word, arming ourselves with this gospel armor so that we're ready to make a stand. Anyways, uh, you know, and I should add about these two witnesses we don't know for sure who they are. The, the, the common, remember you can read about it in Revelation chapter 11, homework assignment right now, pause the video, check it out, or, you know, stick with the continuity of this lesson, but check out Revelation chapter 11 for more on the two witnesses. Now, are we speaking to literal people? I, you know, a part of me hopes so, because how cool would it be to see somebody, you know, uh, causing all kinds of miracles and plagues on this ungodly world, but could, of course, be symbolic as much of the book of Revelation is as well. You know, we find the Old and New Testament sometimes referred to as two witnesses, where we have 
two witnesses for that one Christ and for God's plan of redemption. So it could be a reference to something symbolic like that. We don't know for sure. Just as these people were curious about who was fulfilling what role, we too anticipate and look forward to, not blindly, educating ourselves beforehand as best we can so that we can recognize these signs and these prophecies being unfolded before us as they are even today. So, uh, verse 22, Then said they unto him, Who art thou, that we may give an answer to them that sent us? What sayest thou then of thyself? So, they were sent by the real uh, uptight organization downtown to find out what, who he was, what he was doing. He was causing a stir. He was teaching God's word. I hope you're ruffling some feathers as well in this life. And anyway, so they sent him to find out who this guy was and what he was doing. By the way, I think it's interesting. We read a couple verses back in verse 19 when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him. Notice the separation there, the priests and Levites. Now, traditionally, most scholars would, would agree that we're referring to priests and Levites because not necessarily all priests were Levites. A priest had to be a Levite, but a Levite didn't necessarily mean you were a priest. You had to be specifically of the, the children or the offspring, the, the, the descendants of Aaron, who of course was a Levite. But of that specific lineage of Aaron to be a priest, all Levites had a role that they would perform in and around the temple in the Old Testament, of course, in the Levitical system, the Levitical priesthood, we read about back in, in uh, Numbers and Deuteronomy and, and so on. But this could, I, I just draw your attention to it, make your own mind up, but I draw attention to the fact that the priests and Levites here mentioned separately because at that time, and we read about this in Ezra and Nehemiah, when the children of Israel came back out of captivity. They did a bit of a roll call to see how many Levites, how many priests we have. And we notice, and we notice not only specifically mentioned there, but the names themselves being not Hebrew names, we can recognize that many of those so-called priests and Levites were not at all actual priests and Levites, but were perhaps those that we read about in Revelation 2, 9 and 3, 9, those who claim to be of our brother Judah and aren't and are lying and are of the synagogue of Satan. So whether they're literal or figurative children of Satan, that's another lesson for another time. But you can make your own mind up here if this is a, a, a hint by the Holy Spirit as to who was really questioning John the Baptist here. By the way, I should mention, my role here, my job, my goal is not necessarily to convince you of all of my pretty funky Bible theories. And I mean, I think they're fantastic, but obviously they're my. The point is, my, my goal is not to convince you to my way of thinking with the Bible. My goal is to motivate you and to help you, arm you to study the Bible, the Word of God for yourself to draw your own conclusions, not listening to me, that guy, this guy, that church, that preacher, but to draw your own, to get into your own exploration, your own deep diving. I'm not talking just a surface reading, but a deep exploration of your father's letter to you, the Bible, so you can arm yourself, draw your own conclusions. There are many uh, doctrines, there's no arguing. They're black and white. However, you know, if I'm being honest, there are some doctrines where, you know, so-and-so might think this, this scholar might have this opinion, this scholar, and that's fine. Your job, your, you know, exciting mission, your exciting, the, the, the excitement, one of the great excitements in this life is for you yourself to discover the depth and the, the, the amazing book that this is in front of you for yourself, not just with me once a week, not just with your church on Sundays, not just in your Bible study group that you go to once a week, but for you yourself to dive deep into his word and see what it says to you.
So, uh, I believe we're at verse 21. And they asked him, what the, art thou Elias? Again, Elijah. And he said, oh, I'm sorry, we already read that verse. 23, there we go. He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as he said, as said the prophet Isaiah. So that's Isaiah. So this is a quote from Isaiah chapter 40. Now I'm going to give you some real homework to check out Isaiah chapter 40. Read that whole chapter. It won't take you long, five minutes, but it is an amazing chapter. And see for yourself what relates to Christ, what is prophetic of Jesus' first coming, and what is yet, yet to be fulfilled in an exciting way during his second coming. If you ever need some, uh, to, some context, of what we're seeing in the world today, what we're seeing on a on a government level, level, on a societal level. If you need some context, if you need some humility, check out Isaiah chapter 40. And when it's done putting you in your place, and I would hope putting the leaders of this world into their place, check out that last verse to see how God even though we are here, loves us and is willing to elevate us to here. Not ourself elevating, watch out, dangerous doctrine, but God elevating us to the status of his children, his sons, his daughters. Amazing. Anyways, Isaiah chapter 40. You know, I'm going to check in next session and make sure you did your homework. Pause it now if you need to. Do it after the session. Either way, Isaiah chapter 40. Good read. So, verse 24, And they which were sent were of the Pharisees. Pharisees meaning the separated ones. And, and not in the way Christ, as the anointed one, is separated of God. These were separated by all on their own. So you know what kind of pride and ego we're talking about here. I suspect the same sort of pride and ego that we read uh well, like father, like son, right? Their father, in a spiritual sense, or on another level, their father, the devil, also had a certain ego and a certain pride. And that's why we're in this mess to begin with. But I digress again. Hey, you're supposed to catch me when I digress like that. Let's keep going. So, verse 25, And they asked him and said unto him, why baptizest thou then, if thou be not that Christ, nor Elias, neither that prophet? So again here, we see, we see three roles referenced. We have the Christ, and we have Elijah, or that prophet being mentioned. Elijah being prophesied in, in ooh, Ma, Micah, or Malachi. We'll have to double check after the session. Being prophesied, he'll come before that great and terrible day of the Lord. And John the Baptist, as we read in the other Gospels, came in the spirit of Elijah. But as he admits even here, he wasn't Elijah himself. Does that mean that there is yet a future uh, appearance of the prophet Elijah? Being that Elijah, as we read back there in the Old Testament, did not die, did not see death the way that we all see death in this physical body, but he was taken. He was taken out by God a little bit early. So does that mean that he could be one, he could be one of those two witnesses who will taste death at the hand of the Antichrist just prior to Christ's second coming. Perhaps another clue could be Enoch because it was the same thing. He did not die, but God took him out early and Enoch prophesied of the Lord coming. He's coming with 10,000 of his saints as we read in the book of Jude. But I don't know. I, I guess we'll see. So we have these three roles hinted at here again, and uh, they ask him, why, why are you baptizing then? And of course the answer is because he's preparing. He's preparing the hearts and the minds of the people to see, to receive that message that Jesus is going to be bringing forth, that message of repentance, that message of salvation, God's plan for salvation. Jesus as we'll see here in a bit, Jesus himself, the name Yahshua, meaning Yah, God, God's Savior, God's salvation, 
God's plan for salvation. Yahshua, meaning the, the same name as we find in the Old Testament of Joshua. We we stumble, we, we pronounce it, we, we, we fumble it in our clumsy English tongue. But Joshua, there's no ja in the Hebrew language. It was Yah, Yahshua. Same name for Jesus. We probably had Yahshua, Joshua being a very popular name at the time. There were probably many Yahshua's around. That's why we have in a lot of places the distinction of Yahshua, Jesus from Nazareth, to distinguish him from what was probably a popular name at that time. But there is only one, Yahshua, the Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One. Yahshua, Yahweh's Savior, Yahweh's Salvation, Christ, Christos, the Anointed One, the Messiah. Yahshua, Messiah, our salvation, our Messiah whom this entire book speaks of. So, verse 26, John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you, whom ye know not. Verse 27, he it is who coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoes latcheth, I am not worthy to unloose. So John baptizes with water but there's coming one who doesn't just baptize with water but baptism of the holy spirit signifying as we touched on last session this new birth this new creation you didn't have a say in your first birth the first time you came out of the waters the embryonic waters you didn't have a choice you didn't have a say in that per se at least not a conscious say in this flesh body but the second birth this new birth, it, what the physical baptism is supposed to represent, this spiritual new birth, a baptism of the Holy Spirit, an invitation of that Holy Spirit to dwell within you and a commitment to Christ, to God's plan, God's access to himself, a commitment, a new birth coming out of these waters, symbolizing a death of your prior life, and a new birth in Jesus Christ. You know, this knowing then what baptism represents, it seems uh, counterproductive, for lack of a, a better word, to baptize someone who is too young to, <laughs> to feed themselves, to walk, to do anything, to make this kind of a conscious decision commitment to follow Christ, to commit their life, to, to, to kill their old life and take part in this new birth. We need to be of an age to, 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 to understand that commitment that we're making, right? So, and I'm not judging anyone. I'm saying what it is and, <laughs> well, go ahead and be offended because you know, we like that kind of thing. We like to offend. So let's keep going. Uh, verse, oh, oh, hey, wait, let's talk some more about verse 26. John said, I'm not worthy to even loose the latches, to even untie his shoes or his sandals. What a cool study it makes. I highly recommend it to go back and trace the times where these shoes are mentioned. We read way back in Exodus. We see the voice of the burning bush, that Ia Asha Ia, the I am, that I am, God, the self-existent one, telling Moses, hey, remove your shoes, you're on holy ground. We see Joshua, when coming face to face, Joshua in the Old Testament, to, to specify, in the Old Testament, coming face to face with the angel of the Lord, who many scholars would, would agree that that is most likely a... a, a a revelation of God himself or a Old Testament appearance of Jesus Christ coming face to face with that angel with the sword drawn telling Joshua hey take off your shoes you're on holy ground identifying him with that same voice of the burning bush what's with the shoes we get a deeper understanding we're gonna get it spoiler alert we're gonna get it in this book of John that deeper understanding of why God wants you to take off your shoes before him. Yes, it is an acknowledgement of his royalty, of his holiness. 
of our lack of even being worthy to be in his presence, especially in the state we're in. But it's more than that. It's deeper than that. John isn't worthy to take off his shoes because God, or John the Baptist wasn't worthy to wash Jesus' feet as Jesus washes his disciples' feet. We're going to read later on in this book of John. Making them clean. Purifying us so that we can be in the presence of God. This is why, yes, he's holy. Yes, he's royalty. Yes, he's the king of the universe. But that's not why he wants you to take off his shoes. He wants you to take off your shoes in his presence so he can wash your feet. Oh, whew, amazing. Super cool. Super cool. When we walk in this world, especially back then, they wore the sandals, right? But when we walk around in this world, our feet get a little dirty. We pick up some filth. We pick up some sin. We pick up... Uh, you, you you don't even know where we've been. We're so dirty. And Christ, Jesus Christ, on that cross, paying for our sin, makes us clean, washes our feet. Peter would say, wash, wash all of me, because he got it. He understood Christ purifying us to be again in the presence of our Father, so that we can call him Father about that we can call the creator of the universe father he is he knows you better than you know you he is the closest relative you have he knows the imaginations of our thoughts as we read in the scriptures your thoughts even the deepest part of your subconscious he knows that's a scary thought <laughs> and a refreshing thought at the same time, as we are washed clean by Jesus Christ. Very cool, very cool stuff. Verse 28. These things were done in Bath Bathabara, beyond Jordan, where John was baptizing. Bathabara meaning Beth, sorry, Bethabara. Beth, like Bethlehem, meaning the house. Beth meaning house, house, fairy house, or the house of the fairies meaning these commercial ships. This was a, a junction of different waters coming together, different play, different rivers intersecting, different waters intersecting, I should say. Beth, like Bethlehem, meaning Beth, the house of bread. So Beth meaning house. This is the fairy house, the house of the connected waterways. I find it very cool that John, using... Uh, performing his ministry, his message at this place where the ministry of Christ would intersect with his ministry. I think that's kind of cool. By the way, Beth Barra also being probably where Joshua, that Yeshua in the Old Testament, would cross over into the promised land with his troops to take over, to reclaim that land as God himself, of course, promised, right? So a historical spot, a lot going on there. Verse 29 the next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. We're running out of time, so we're going to stop there for tonight. But what an amazing verse. John's, you know, we can think of John the Baptist as being really the end of the Old Testament, the end of that era of prophets. And right here, we just came to that intersection where Jesus Christ, that New Testament, that New Covenant, would take place that lamb of god that's quite an introduction and sometimes on our ears on our again english speaking ears or on our uneducated of historical events or of the old testament on our ears sometimes that loses a bit of its meaning but the lamb of god meaning the fulfillment of that Passover celebration that would take place in Exodus. When we, when we think of Jesus Christ as the Lamb of God, rightfully so, we right away go back to Exodus and that Lamb of God whose blood on the posts would stop the death angel from coming into your house just as the blood of that Lamb today sprinkled on the posts of your house, on the posts of your life, stops death itself from having any power over you. But it didn't start there. It goes all the way back 
even into the book of Genesis, where we see Abraham, Genesis 22, we see Abraham and Isaac, a unique event that gives us some insight into God's own heart. We see Abraham saying himself that God himself would provide a lamb. God would provide himself a lamb. And we see that fulfilled by John, or, or introduced by John the Baptist here. I find it interesting, by the way, that Abraham would say, God would provide himself a lamb. We could read that two ways. God would provide a lamb himself. God's going to provide the lamb. Or God's going to provide himself as the lamb. Ooh, cool stuff. And by the way, we even see earlier on in the book of Genesis, we see Abel bringing the firstlings of his flock. I have no doubt was a lamb there as well. Abel, of course, again, prophecy, not just prediction fulfillment, which of course it is, especially from the Greek mind, but from the Hebrew mind, we see prophecy as patterns, pattern of events historically repeating themselves as a lesson for you and me, what we should be looking for. Abel bringing himself, his lamb, as a sacrifice for God, and Abel, of course, being murdered by his brother, being one of the first sacrifices, in a sense, a prophetic example, because Abel's line was that line whom Christ should have come. That's why, of course, we see that attack by Satan on that line right away. We saw the attack in the garden on Eve. We saw the attack on Abel. We see Satan's attack throughout the Old Testament as he tries to stop that plan of God, as he, when he tries to stop Yeshua, Yahweh's plan for salvation. It started in the garden. It continued with Cain and Abel. It continued with the fallen angels in Genesis 6. It continued with the death of the firstborn in Egypt. I'm, I'm skipping over a few, but I'm giving you a, a, the cliff notes. It continued with the death of the firstborn by Herod. It continued with Satan himself tempting Jesus. Hey, jump off these rocks and attempt at Jesus' life. He didn't want Christ going to the cross. The cross, remember, well, unbeknownst to him, the cross was not a tragedy, but a triumph. Oh, let's bow our hearts. Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you, Father, for your word made flesh and how we can access you, our creator, our father. Oh, we, we kneel at your presence. Father, we thank you so much for everything you do for us, for your love. Thank you for lighting our feet, for providing a lamp for our path, for bringing us to you. Father, we just... We want your will to be done and your kingdom to come. We anxiously await serving the king of the universe, in whose name we always pray, Yeshua, Messiah, our Lord. Amen. May God bless you this week. May you walk with God as I know he's walking with you. May you have spiritual discernment, a, a sensitivity to his Holy Spirit guiding you through your life this week. May God's hedge of protection be around you and your family. In Yeshua's name, we always ask, we always pray. Good night.